I'll be turning to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 will be there in just a moment. And I want to say thank you to those that participated in Serve Day last week. And I think we've got some pictures that we can put up on the screen of some of the projects that took place last week. Uh, this was some folks that putting together some goodie bags for our homeless friends. And, uh, and this is a uh, project that took place at uh, one of our, I think, day school teachers' houses. And then uh, we had uh, some folks go down the street to the Family Guidance Center and uh, bless them and their facility. And then this was at Hawkin Elementary School, a uh, school that we partner with and have adopted. And we, and I got to tell you, if you'll leave it on that picture for just a second, this was um, a special needs young man at Hawkin Elementary School. And I got this picture. Uh, he had stopped his teacher uh, during the course of the week and, and just said, uh, just said, these flowers are so beautiful. Can I just stand, can I just sit here for just a second and look at them? And, and uh, that's a, just a testament to what God did last week as we were able to bless our community and, and uh, be able to serve our community partners. So thank you for those that, that served last week on Serve Day. And then this was some of our teenagers who went down to the uh, UAB campus house and along with our young professionals just did a lot of great work down there. So uh, what a great day. We give God all the glory and praise for that, and uh, so what, a, what a blessing it is to serve our community. Uh, well, today we, uh, we're jumping into a new series after uh, in a series that we've had on, on angels, and now we're, we're jumping into a new series that I'm calling uh, What Jesus Hates. And uh, this is actually a series that's a, an adaptation uh, from a preacher friend of mine that I got to hear a few years ago, Rick Ashley at the Pepperdine Lectures. And uh, Rick is gracious to share his material with, with some other ministers. And so this is kind of an adaptation of that series that he has done. But my guess is that when we see those words together, does, does it make anybody uncomfortable to see the word Jesus next to the word hate? Uh, I don't know about you, but, but that kind of makes me uncomfortable. And uh, if that makes you uncomfortable, uh, then you're, you're in good company because, like I said, that makes me uncomfortable as well. But even though it makes me a little uncomfortable to see those words together, uh, the Bible is very comfortable uh, putting these words together. Uh, we look in places like Proverbs 6.16 where it says, There are six things that the Lord hates seven things that are detestable to him. And then scripture goes on to list things like a lying tongue or feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pour, pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Uh, we read in Amos 5.21 where the Lord says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. And then we, we read in places like Revelation chapter 2 where the, the Lord hates the practices of the Nicolaitans. And so th this, this word hate and, and being combined with the Lord are, are something that, that the Bible is very comfortable sharing. Now, we, we could probably uh, speculate on a lot of other things that God hates. Uh, God hates demonic activity. I'm sure we would agree with that. God hates the New York Yankees. I'm sure we, I'm sure we would agree with that. Uh, God hates playing on your cell phone in church. I mean, these are just things that God hates. God hates most cats. I mean, this is just things that, that God hates, right? And what I've just done is what Christians have done for centuries when we begin to speculate on things that God hates. And what we tend to do is we want the things that we hate, we put those on God because we want them to line up, we want him to line up with us. And I just want to challenge us that when we begin to do that, church, what we are doing is we are making God in our image instead of us in his. And so during this course of this series, I just want us to, to take an honest look at Scripture, and in particular the Gospels, and, and see uh, what it is that Jesus hates. And one of the things that I, I did this week is just began to go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just go through the Gospels, and, and you just begin to see the number of times that Jesus rebukes someone or something 
Much of Jesus' ministry is spent confronting things. And as you read through the Gospels, and you don't have to take my word for it, you can just start going through the Gospels yourself over these next few weeks, and just see the number of times that Jesus rebukes someone or rebukes something. Now, I want you to notice what this series is not entitled. This series is not entitled, Who Jesus Hates. The series is entitled, What Jesus Hates. I think that's a very important distinction. So, as we get into this, uh, what I began to be convinced of as I was reading through the Gospels this week was that Jesus hates whatever gets in the way of God's love. I want you to reflect on that for a moment. Let me ask you something. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But how many of us in this room have ever gotten mad at church? Anybody ever gotten mad at church? I mean, you may be mad about something that's already happened today at church, you know, but have you ever gotten mad at church? You know, it's curious that Jesus got mad at church once. And here's the context. It's in Mark chapter 2. And I asked you to flip to just a moment ago. And in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23, the Bible says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now right, right off the bat, we notice something curious here. Right off the bat, we notice that the Pharisees are in the grain fields. Now, the Pharisees are just this religious sect, this Jewish religious sect, that they, they, they have this very strict observance of the law. Matter of fact, um, if you were to go to Israel today, uh, I, I went a few years ago, and if you go to Israel today, there's, there's even, if you were to get on an elevator, <laughs> I mean, you, 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 they don't even allow you to push the buttons on the elevator. It just stops on every floor automatically. You can't even push the buttons because that is work on the Sabbath day. And so the, these Pharisees are, are this, this, very, the, the, this very strict observing people to the law. And what are they doing in the grain fields? Well, they, they're not even, I mean, against their own law, they're not even supposed to be in the grain fields doing anything anyway. But what are they doing in the grain fields? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're, no pun intended, they're stalking. They're stalking Jesus is what they're doing in the grain fields. And they're trying to trap him. And so here they are, stalking Jesus in the grain fields. And like a lot of religious groups, the Pharisees were known for what they were against. It was their religious duty to find someone somewhere doing something wrong. Aren't you thankful that we don't have Pharisees today? I uh, got a, a letter just this uh, past week or maybe two weeks ago. And the letter started, it is my religious Christian duty to let you know you're doing something wrong. That's how the letter began. <laughs> and so here, here the Pharisees, you know, this is their religious duty to, to, to find out what, what people are doing wrong. And one definition of legalism is when we make rules to help protect God's law and we preach our rules with the same authority as God's word. And so what the Pharisees did is they put up these fences. And they would put up fences, and the fences would become the authority of what they what they preached and what they taught. And so they put up a fence here, and then they say, Whoa, whoa, you can't, no, no, you can't go over here either. You got to put up this fence right here. And, and no, 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 we got to put up a fence over here as well. And don't, don't go past this fence. This, and so they were setting up fences all over the place, 
all these religious rules. And as they were setting up fences, and, and fences, let's just be clear, are not always a bad thing, are they? No matter of fact, I've got two small children, another one on the way, due next month. You know what? I kind of like having a fence sometimes, you know, because if they're running around and I know they can't go beyond the fence, I kind of I like a fence. We have, we have some dogs in our neighborhood, and I'm glad that some of them are behind a fence. Because as I'm walking down the street and they're going nuts, I'm, just, I'm glad there's a fence there, right? And so fences aren't always a bad thing, but, but what the Pharisees are doing is they're making the fence the highest authority. They're making the fence something that they put their trust in. And so the, the conflict here, you see the disciples are in the grain fields. And I would submit that the disciples are not trying to be confrontational. They're, they're not, I, I don't believe that the disciples are saying, hey, hey, let's see how we can stir up the Pharisees today and let's go in the grain fields and start, start picking some. I, I don't think the, the disciples are trying to be confrontational here. I think they had a very legitimate reason for being in the grain fields. They were hungry. I think that's a legitimate reason to eat when we're hungry. And so here they are in the grain fields, and the conflict is over these two differing views of how you please God. And it's on the screen. If you want to jot this down in your notes, the question is, is it the love of law or is it the law of love? Do I love the law? Do I love the fence more than I ascribe to the law of love? So this uh, past week for the first time in my life, I had jury duty. And uh, I learned a thing or two about our laws in the state of Alabama. And uh, I, I gained a whole new respect for those attorneys among us. I had gained a whole new respect for judges, gained a whole new respect for plaintiffs and defendants and, and the whole system. It was, it was really eye-opening to me to, to be able to, to do this all week. And, and I thought because I was a minister, I was going to get struck right out of the gate. But they, they left me on, and I got to go through pretty much the whole process. And it was very intriguing to me. And our system is in place to show respect to the law. And the, and the Pharisees here say, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, <laughs> your disciples, they're not respecting the law of God. Jesus, and, and then Jesus does something. We just read it. Jesus cuts them down with their own sword. He says, have you never read? Now, he's talking to the Pharisees. These guys live in the library. Matter of fact, if they had the Internet... They'd be posting every day on Facebook about their interpretation of the law and how, how their interpretation is right. Again, thankful we don't have any of that going on today. Jesus says, have you never read? Have you never read what? Then he tells them a story that they've read a thousand times and missed. There's David. He's being chased by Saul. Now, David's not king yet. He's been anointed to be king, but he's not king yet. Saul is still king. And David and his men are hungry. And so, so he goes into the house of God where the high priest uh, Abiathar is there. And he, and he says, I'm hungry. I need something to eat. Well, what's the problem? In, in, in the house of God, there's, there's consecrated bread. And you can go all the way back to Leviticus, and you can see the law on this. And when you read where you make 12 loaves and every Sabbath, and only the priest can eat the bread. You have six loaves on one side, six loaves on the other side, and only the priest can eat the bread. And, and what happens? Well, as Jesus points out, 
David said, give me some bread. I'm hungry. Again, a pretty legitimate reason to ask for some bread. And what did the high priest do? He gave it to him. See, church, the purpose of the law was to bless people. The same purpose for the Sabbath was to bless people. And the, and the Pharisees had, had gotten it completely backwards. That's why Jesus even said, no, no, I, I didn't create a Sabbath and then, and then create man to honor the Sabbath. That's, that's not how I did it. I created man, and then I made a Sabbath to, to honor the man, to bless the man. And they had got it, they had got it completely backwards. They had flip-flopped it completely. And their, their blindness in the field led to unkindness in church. And so this is the context that leads us into Mark chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look into Mark chapter 3 because I think there's a reason that the, the writer has put these sto two stories back to back. Now, I'm not saying that these two stories happened on the same day. We don't know that. They may not have even happened in the same week. But the, the, the writer chose to put these two stories next to each other because they make a similar point. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Now, before we read on, I, I, just, I just have to think that like Peter is sitting there thinking, Oh, here he goes again. Here goes Jesus again. Now, Jesus, I, I got, you know, this guy has a shriveled hand. This is not a life and death situation. You could totally wait to do this tomorrow or the next day. But here you are going to stand him up right in front of everybody in church. Stand him up in the synagogue. And then Jesus asked in verse 4, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. Now watch this. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus says, you're telling me, you're telling me that it's better for me to do nothing than to do something good? And I want you to notice, this is the only time in the Bible, if you find it anywhere else, let me know. This is the only time in the Bible that it is recorded that Jesus is angry. Now, I'm not saying this is the only time that Jesus got angry. I think we could point to several examples where Jesus got angry. But this is the only time it comes out and just says it. He looked at them in anger. And where was he angry? He was angry in church. And who was he angry at? The people in charge of church. And I think we need to hear this because most of us go to church a lot. We do church. And I think we need to hear that Jesus can get really mad at people in church. But here's the key. And it's not found in this Mark passage. It's found in the same story that's recorded by Matthew. So if you want to flip over a few pages to Matthew chapter 12, same story, but Matthew gives us this extra verse that I think is key. Matthew 12, verse 7. Jesus says, If you had known what these words mean, I desire Mercy, not sacrifice. 
you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Huh. It's not on the screen, but you can jot this down, that Jesus is distressed when mercy isn't stressed. Their God, the Pharisees' God, was the policeman who's sitting behind the billboard waiting to give you a ticket, waiting to pull out and write you a ticket. And if that is your God, if that is how you image your God, then that is the God that you're going to worship. That's the God that you're going to become. And we dismiss those sometimes who need a second chance. So one time Jesus goes to this party, and the, the people who needed a second chance are there. And we read in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. Here it comes again. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. I desire mercy. He's quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. And he's not just quoted it once now. If Jesus says something once, I'm listening. If he quotes it again, <laughs> I believe we need to tune in and pay specific attention to this. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Albert, Albert Switzer was a great humanitarian that went to Africa. And even though he was a great doctor, uh, he was also considered one of the world's great musicians. And he was uh, getting on a boat from Africa to come back, and, and there was a, a nurse that was getting on the boat with him. And it was a nurse that had served on one of his medical missions. And he recognized her, and he stopped the nurse. And he just grabbed her by the arm, and he just said, I just want you to know that a few months ago, you held a, a crying baby in your arms, and the baby had a fever, and the, the outlook was, was not, not looking great. So you took the baby into your room, and you held that baby in your arms all night. And I heard, I listened to that baby crying all night long. And then finally, in the wee hours of the early morning, the baby stopped crying. And Albert said, I knew at that moment that the fever had broke and that the baby was going to be okay. And he said, even though I am an accomplished musician, world-renowned, he said, that was the most beautiful music I've ever heard. And folks, what Jesus, I believe, is saying here is that I know the music that God likes to hear. I know. We're kind of close. I know the music that God likes to hear. And I hate it when you get in the way of what God loves. Now, I'm sure there's, there's some much deeper, more profound theological truth that you can, that you can glean from these texts. I'm sure there is. But, but the one simple question that keeps coming back to me as I, as I reflect on this text in Mark 2 and 3 is, do I ever make Jesus angry? Because I don't want to do that. I don't want to make Jesus angry. And so three thoughts as we close here that I believe will help us this week. And we've sang about a lot of these throughout the course of our worship time today. You've, you've seen that word mercy in several of the songs that we sang today. I want you to jot these down. Number one is that we must read Scripture through a mercy 
lens. This text says that it's possible, church, get this, this is so important, and this is really important for me to hear, so I'm going to say it to myself, and then you can just listen in. It is possible to major in Bible and yet fail the exam. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. One of the things that I struggle with as a, as a preacher is that you can spend your entire life in the Word. And not let the word get in you. We must read scripture through a mercy lens. I had a friend uh, teach me one time that he said when, when he reads scripture, that oftentimes he will just visualize reading it in the shadow of the cross. He'll just he'll just visualize that shadow coming over his Bible when he reads. And it just helps, it helps remind him. And when I've done that, it helps remind me as I'm, as I'm reading the text to read it in the context of the mercy of Jesus. And somehow, I think by doing so, I'm going to read it better when I read it through the lens of the mercy of God. Number two is that we must lead with mercy to follow Jesus. Now, that sounds counterintuitive in order to lead we must in order to follow we must lead and we, we must lead with mercy to follow Jesus pop quiz do most of us lead with mercy do most of us and you have to answer this for yourself I can't answer it for you do most of us lead with mercy or do most of us lead with observance to our religious rules I can't answer that question for you How do, you, how do you lead with mercy? Is following Jesus about having our fences in the right place? <laughs> if I just do church right, if I just do my devotions right, if I just get it right, and here's what I've learned, church, is that the absence of mercy cannot overcome my religious activity. So I think Jesus was on to something here. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's what Jesus said. If you have a problem with that, take it up with him. <laughs> Religious activity is, is easy because you don't have to get your hands dirty. But ministry is messy. Because what I've learned is that people make messes. So Jesus says a guy goes down the road and he, he gets mugged and he's left in the ditch and two guys walk by and they know the rules. Don't touch a dead body. They know the rules. And so they walk by. And then a Samaritan comes by and he helped the man. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus told him to go and feel likewise. No, wait a minute, I read that wrong. Jesus said, go and pray likewise. No, that's not right either. Jesus said, go and preach likewise. Your church needs a good sermon on mercy. No, he doesn't say that either. Jesus says, go and do likewise. And church, I believe that when we show mercy, that place where we're showing mercy becomes a sanctuary. So we must lead with mercy to follow Jesus. The last one is this, is we, we must need mercy before we'll ever grant it. I believe you become a terrible interpreter of Scripture when you don't realize how much you need mercy. 
The priest and the Levite, they walked by. Why? Because they could not see themselves in the ditch. They couldn't see themselves in that much need of, of mercy. And so they walked on by. I heard a story this past week of this teacher in New York City. He would go into his classroom every day. And if you've ever been to New York City, you know there's, there's just a lot of noise. There's a, a lot of sirens and things. And so sirens would be whizzing by, ambulances, fire trucks. And he would get so agitated. And he would tell his class, you know, I can't teach because of all this noise. And he would try and go and slam a window down to, to, to try to cancel out the noise. And he was just so agitated. All this noise coming by his window every day while he's trying to teach. And then one Monday morning, he comes in to his classroom, apologizes to his class. This, the previous weekend, his wife and his baby had been saved by an ambulance that took them to the hospital. And he, he made this comment, and it was, it was so profound to me. He said, I was listening to the noise and not thinking about the lives. And I, I wonder, can you and I, can you see yourself in the ditch? You've been robbed of your dignity because of sin. You've been stripped by the forces of evil. And here's the thing. All your religious activity just passes on by. It can't help you. All the times that you've been to church, those are, that's a great thing. All the times that you've had, that's a great thing. But all the religious activity passes on by. Because what you need is mercy. And when I realized what a mess that I was in, I think I became a better minister. But more than that, I think I've become more compassion and more compassionate for messy people. Church, if I, if I err on one side or the other, I want to err on mercy. Because I don't think Jesus would get mad at that. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful for your grace. Uh, we're grateful for your mercy that sustains us. And I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for the example that we have through the life of Jesus, that he's the only one that can save, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to you except through him. God, I pray today as we reflect on how we're going to lead with mercy in the way that we follow Jesus, I pray that your spirit will convict us this week in certain moments, in certain opportunities. Maybe it's with a family member. Maybe it's with a coworker. Maybe it's uh, just somebody in our neighborhood. Or, or maybe it's somebody in this, in this room right now, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, help us to remember that Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be standing this morning, and if you have a need this morning that one of our shepherds can pray over, I'm going to ask you to come down front or make your way back here to this room for a more private setting. If today is the day that you want to receive the mercy of Christ and be baptized into him, we would love to celebrate that with you. There's nothing more that we'd rather do. Come as we sing this song. Yeah.